it was during the birthday time i went to the accommodation office seeking a room the accommodation in charge said yes i will give you a room and he mentioned the building where rooms are available and where he will give me a room next day sami said you know last time when your parents came they were staying in one room i will give you the same room this time also i still remember the room number round building 3 room number a11 couple of days later when i went to collect the keys i asked the in charge sir would i be getting the same room as last time so he said no that room has been allocated to another student's parents so i will give you another room again that day swami said see last time whatever room you got same room i'll give you this time but i was thinking why is swami saying this when that room has already been allotted to some other parents and the day arrived when i had to collect the keys i went to the accommodation office and i requested for the room keys and the in charge he handed over the keys to me when i looked at the keys i was surprised because the room number was round 3 a11 it used to be said that shri baba used to say that all devotees are like sparrows tied to baba's fingers with threads whenever baba wanted to meet a particular devotee he would just move his fingers and the sparrows would come flying and that is the case with all of us at some point or the other we have all been called to the lotus feet of bhagwan and at, that happens only through swami's will i would like to start off with how my family came to the fold of sai baba there are many reasons which pull devotees towards swami if you are a youngster looking for good education then bhagwan has built beautiful institutions and that attracts lots of youngsters if you are somebody who is looking for health bhagwan has built beautiful hospitals and that has pulled in many thousands of devotees into his fold and if you are somebody who is looking for spiritual wisdom then bhagwan has blessed everyone abundantly through his darshan sparshan and sambhashan in my case i came here as a student let me narrate the circumstances under which i came to prashanti nilayam as a student this was during the mid 90s between 93 to 96 when i was doing my undergraduation at hyderabad my father used to work in a private firm which was not doing very well as a youngster i had lots of dreams i wanted to pursue my mba after completing my undergraduation and one of those days what happened was the company where my father was working that closed down completely along with hundreds of other employees even my father lost his job my father he he didn't keep good health those days so he was forced to sit at home at a pretty young age and the the burden of taking care of the family fell on my mother we were three brothers and all of us were in college now consider somebody who is wanting to do his mba course those days an mba course would cost you a minimum of 2 lakh rupees i'm talking about the mid 90s one day when i was on my way to college i met one of my father's colleagues when he saw me he came and he spoke to me and this was just before the factory closed down and he told me the company is not in good shape i don't think we will have our jobs for long what i would advise you is to stop studying search for a job and take care of the family 
I was very young and I was not even 22. So this particular conversation was very painful because I wanted to study further. I didn't know Swami those days, but whichever gods I knew then, I prayed fervently that I should be able to complete my higher studies. As days passed, I finished my undergraduation and I was beginning to prepare for my MBA exams. My mother advised me that I should apply to Prashant Nilayam. I knew nothing about Swami, but I knew that there was this university which provided great education. So upon the advice of my mother, I, I did apply to Prashant Nilayam. After a few days, I got the hot ticket to come to the university for the exam. And it was during the first week of May 97 that I came to Prashant Nilayam for the first time. So the bus stand is right opposite the Mandir gate. And when I got down from the bus, I had no clue where to go, what to do. But there were many other youngsters in the bus and I knew that they had all come to write the exam. So I just followed them into the ashram. We went to the accommodation office, got a room. The very next day, uh, appeared for the written exam. I fortunately cleared it. And then we had a group discussion and interview with the, the management committee. Couple of weeks later, I came to know that I was selected as a student at the Sri Satsai Institute of Higher Learning. It was on the 31st of May, 97, that I formally joined Prashant Nilayam as a student. It also happened to me my 22nd birthday. I had never seen Swami before. And when I joined Prashant Nilayam, Swami at that time was in Vrindavan. The entire life at Prashant Nilayam was new to me. I never stayed in a hostel before. But then I was quite surprised to see that all the students were very friendly and they used to address each other as brothers. I was very happy. Since Bhagwan was at Vrindavan, every evening the bhajans used to be held in the, in the hostel, dining hall. One of those days, an announcement was made that Swami would be coming soon to Prashant Nilayam. It was announced that on the 15th of June, 97, Bhagwan would come to Prashant Nilayam from Vrindavan. So the moment this news was announced, all the boys started cheering and clapping. I actually wondered why, because I had absolutely no experience. I had never even seen Swami. I used to wonder why students are so happy that Swami is coming to Prashant Nilayam. Couple of days passed and the day arrived when Bhagwan was finally coming from Vrindavan to Prashant Nilayam. It was around noon when all the students went from the university to Mandir. Swami was expected to arrive at that time. And I still remember there was Vedam chanting going on, bhajans were being sung, and even the band of both the university and the school were playing their instruments. Amidst all this, I had my first darshan of Bhagwan. Swami's car gently came into the Sai Kulant Hall and Bhagwan got down from his car with a beautiful smile on his face. And the moment Bhagwan got down from the car, I had this feeling that he looked at me. It was a peculiar feeling. I'm sure everyone feels that Bhagwan looks at them. So the first darshan was very pleasing. After the darshan, we all went back to the hostel. And once the classes were over for the day, in the evening, we came back to Mandir for the formal darshan that Swami grants every day. As is the custom, when Swami comes from Purnachandra, He walks through the ladies' side, He comes around the gents' side, and finally makes a circle to move towards the interview room. 
I was seated along with a group of students in what is called the second block. Now this block is right next to those figures of lions that you see, which is right next to the Samadhi now. We were seated there. I was seated in the middle of the block. As Bhagwan came close to the interview room, instead of walking up the stairs to go towards the interview room, Swami stopped next to the second block. And the moment Swami stopped there, the, the boys immediately they made a path for Swami to walk into the veranda. Swami took two steps and he stopped right in front of a classmate of mine, Madhukuti. And Swami asked him, where do you come from? The boy replied, Swami from Calicut. Swami asked, not Calcutta? He said, no Swami, from Calicut. Swami nodded and took a few more steps. And since this path was made right through the middle of the block, I happened to be sitting right in the first line. And Swami was just about to pass by me when suddenly he turned and looked at me. And he asked, where do you come from? Now this was the first formal darshan that I was having and I had never before spoken to Bhagwan, So it, I couldn't make out what words Swami was speaking. So I knelt down and I said, pardon sir? And he repeated the question, where do you come from? I said, from Hyderabad, sir. Which course? Again I said, pardon sir? Swami asked, which course? I said, MBA course, sir. Swami asked, what do you mean by MBA? I said, Master of Business Administration. Swami didn't say anything. Swami nodded and went inside. Only later, during the course of uh, the MBA, we came to know that Swami doesn't address MBA course as Masters of Business Administration. He rather prefers what is called the MMM, that is the Master of Man Management. So when Swami spoke and Swami went, the uppermost feeling in my heart at that moment was fear. Because the first time I'm talking to Bhagwan, and I was also aware that lots of people were looking at me and I was very frightened. That evening after the bhajans, when we were going back to hostel, I still remember my teacher, Rangarajan sir, he came and he patted me on the back and said, Arun, you are so lucky that Bhagwan spoke to you. I know devotees who have been coming to Bhagwan for many years and Bhagwan might never have spoken to them. But how fortunate you are that on your very first day, Bhagwan has blessed you with Sambhashan. As the days passed, Swami blessed with many more interactions. It was not just me. I would say it was the entire batch of that particular year who were blessed with many interactions with Bhagwan. As Brother Siddharth said, there, there was a big group of boys that Swami used to frequently speak with. In one such conversation, Bhagwan, he called me and he asked, what is the meaning of Sai Baba? Before I could think of an answer, Bhagwan himself re responded, Sir means divine, I means mother, and Baba means father. Sai Baba is divine mother and father. On another such day, I used to speak to my mother on the phone in the evenings and just, just as uh, my, the company that my father was working in wasn't doing very well, even my mother was working and there was some hardships in the uh, place that she was working in. So that evening when I spoke to her, she told me about what all things are happening. 
and she told me to pray to Bhagwan to help us out uh, with all these challenges. So during darshan time, as Bhagwan passed by me, I I I did have all this conversation with my mother in my mind. So I did look sad, and Bhagwan noticed this. After the interviews were over, when he comes out and when he interacts with the students and teachers, he called me out and he asked, "Why do you look so sad?" So I went close to Bhagwan and said, "Bhagwan, Swami." By then, I, I knew that you address Swami as Swami and not Sir. And I said, Swami, uh, I spoke to my mother. She has lots of problems. And then Swami patted me on my cheek and said, "Your mother has always faced problems in life. It is not, not it's nothing new to her. But remember one thing: when you are with Swami, you don't keep thinking all these things." And then Swami made a profound statement. He said, "You do my work; I will do yours." It was again on one of those days when I was still a new student and I was still coming to know who Bhagwan was. And one evening, when Swami was standing outside interacting with the teachers, the evening bhajan started. and the first bhajan that was sung was sundara sundara vinayaka so i thought in my mind swami is vinayaka and they are singing sundara sundara vinayaka but look at swami he is not very handsome then why do you call him sundara vinayaka the moment this thought came in my mind i felt bad and i prayed to swami saying bhagwan pardon me for this thought and just as the bhajans had started swami proceeded to go towards the bhajan hall and right after he passed by me he turned around and he said why do they say sundara sundara vinayaka he is not sundara he has got a big trunk he is not handsome i knew swami was reflecting my thoughts swami didn't say anything swami just smiled that was an acknowledgement and it has happened many times that swami knows every thought word and deed that we all do and on one another day i still remember the day it was the day that the cricket stadium was inaugurated it was the 27th of december 97 again when swami was going towards the bhajan hall when the bhajan started Swami was in a very happy mood. So when he saw me, he came close to me, and he whispered in my ears. He said, "You are mine, and I am yours." And Bhagwan repeated this in a discourse many days later. Swami, while addressing the devotees, he mentioned the same thing: "You are all mine, and I am yours." so this is and this way the conversations kept happening with bhagwan and slowly slowly bhagwan started uh, bringing in other family members also to the lotus feet when my first year was coming to an end my my brother ajit was finishing his engineering and my parents decided that he too would join prashant nilam as a student and I had purchased the application form, and I sat in Sai Kulwant Hall one morning to get Bhagwan's blessings. I still remember the date; it was the 8th of January, 1998. If you add up all the numbers, it comes to nine, and it was also the day of Vaikuntha Ekadashi. And because it was just before the sports meet, we had all the three campuses of Bhagwan's institutions. present at prashant nilam it was a very beautiful atmosphere in prashant nilam and as swami came for darshan he saw me sitting with this form he looked at it and he asked what is it I said bhagwan application form and swami asked for whom i said swami for my brother and then he asked how many brothers do you have 
I said, Swami, two brothers. And Swami got angry. Swami said, Dunnapota. Dunnapota means bull. Swami said, Dunnapota, look at all these students. Are they not your brothers? You must have a big mind. Don't think you only have two brothers. You have many brothers. One, one aspect of any interaction with Bhagwan is that there always is a lesson in what Swami says. And one, one just has to, you know, ruminate, think about it, and you will find many hidden lessons in those conversations, which might appear casual, but there's a lot of meaning in it. So Swami blessed the application form and I sent it home. And a couple of months later, we were in Vrindavan during the summer vacations of 1998. And we were enjoying the darshans in Vrindavan and the Trai sessions. So one day when I called up home, those days there were no mobile phone, so we always, you know, call up at a particular hour to find out what's happening. So when I called home that day, my mother said that my brother had still not got his hall ticket. How will he appear for the exam? So I was worried because there was hardly a week left for the exam to take place. Now, beautiful thing is the very previous day, during the Trai session, Bhagavan, while he was talking, he looked at me and said, give me your address, write and give me your address. And I was taken aback. Why would Bhagwan require my address? And Swami also changed the topic and continued with his conversation. So even I forgot about it. The next day when I spoke to my mother and she said that this hall ticket had not come. So that evening, just before Trai session, as Bhagwan came, I, I knelt down and I told Bhagwan, Bhagwan, the hall ticket for my brother has still not come. And Swami said, remember yesterday I asked you for your hall ticket? Why do you think I asked you for your hall ticket? I immediately realized my mistake and I, I wrote down my hall ticket and, uh, sorry, the address and handed it over to Bhagwan. And what, what happened was a telegram was sent to my brother asking him to come to Prashant Nilam and collect his hall ticket. And every day, Bhagavan would ask, has your brother come? Has your brother come? My brother had finished his engineering in Kerala, so he was away from home for four years. And he had just come back to Hyderabad in the month of April. And he was appearing for his exams in Prashant Nilayam in May. So my, my parents obviously wanted to spend some more time with my brother. But then Swami kept asking daily, has your brother come? And when I called home, I informed my mother that instead of going back home, let my brother come to Brindavan. And so it happened that even before the results were announced, my brother got the opportunity to come to Brindavan. And beautifully what Swami did was he allowed him to even join the Thrai sessions even before he became a student. And so it, it so happened that my brother and later on even my younger brother, both of them became students of Bhagwan's institute. So that is how Swami kept bringing one by one all the family members to the Lotus Feet. Now, uh, in 1998, the academic year had begun in June. And my brother, after writing his exams, he remained in Brindavan. And directly from Brindavan, he came to Prashant Nilam as a student. So as I said, my parents were missing him badly. And they decided that they will come to Prashant Nilam in the month of June to spend some time with both of us. Almost a day or two after this decision was made by my parents, Swami suddenly asked, when are your parents coming? And I was taken aback, but I said, Swami, they are coming in June to Prashant Nilayam. Swami said, but June, I will not be in Prashant Nilayam. It, it totally, you know, we forgot that 
they were actually coming to meet us and not have Bhagavan's darshan. But Swami was not talking in those terms. Swami said, if they come in June, I will not be in June for me to meet them. Swami said, do one thing, ask them to come in July during Guru Purnima. And so the plan was changed and it was in the month of July 1998 that my parents and younger brother finally came to Prashant Nilayam. And one day before they were supposed to arrive at Prashant Nilayam, I went to the accommodation office uh, seeking a room. Now all of you might be aware, after the birthday celebrations, the, the most uh, crowded festival in Prashant Nilayam is the Guru Purnima and the Shivaratri festivals. And needless to say, even 98, Prashant Nilayam was packed and there were absolutely no rooms available. When Bhagavan was giving interview, uh, I went to the accommodation office and I requested for a room. But the elderly gentleman sitting there said that there were no rooms available. There were so many devotees coming. He is helpless, he said. So I came back to Sai Kulwant Hall. I was very worried because my parents were coming for the first time and I didn't know how to get a room outside the ashram. And just at, at that moment, the interviews got over and Bhagavan came outside and he called me. And the first question he asked was, when are your parents coming? And I said, Bhagavan, they're coming tomorrow. And without, without even saying any word, Swami immediately uh, summoned Mr. Chiranjivira Gauru and said, this boy's parents are coming tomorrow. Please arrange for a room and also see that they get good places to have darshan. And that is how it happened that one by one, all of us were brought to the lotus feet and blessed with lots of interactions. Several months uh, later, it was during the birthday time, Swami again said, ask your parents to come for the birthday. And I, uh, I informed my parents and I again went to the accommodation office seeking a room. And this time uh, the, the accommodation in charge, he said, yes, I will give you a room. And he mentioned the, uh, the building where rooms are available and where he will give me a room. And next day Swami said, you know, last time uh, when your parents came, they were staying in one room. I will give you the same room this time also. I still remember the room number. It was round, block, round building three, room number A11. And a couple of days later, when I went to collect the keys, uh, I asked the uh, in charge, sir, would I be getting the same room as last time? So he said, no, that room has been allocated to another student's parents. So I will give you another room. Again that day, Swami said, I mean, very casually Swami said, see last time, whatever room you got, same room I'll give you this time. I was just praying, Swami, it doesn't matter which room we get, as long as we get a room, that's a great blessing during such a crowded time. And Swami mentioned this couple of times, I'll get you, give you the same room. But I was thinking, why is Swami saying this when that room has already been allotted to some other parents? And the day arrived when I had to collect the keys. I went to the accommodation office and I requested for the room keys. And the in charge, he handed over the keys to me. When I looked at the keys, I was surprised because the room number was round 3, A11. I said, sir, but you mentioned that this room was booked for somebody else. He said, huh, those plans got changed. So you got the same room as last time. So this drama, Swami knew, Swami is omniscient. So though it looks like Maya, he's clear about what's going to happen. So that was another beautiful experience. And when all the three of us brothers were there at the lotus feet, 
Swami once mentioned this. Every one of us, there would be somebody in our family who is responsible for bringing us to Bhagwan. It could be our parents, it could be our grandparents, somebody or the other. So Bhagwan, once when he was interacting with the three of us, Bhagwan said, the reason that the three of you are here sitting at my feet is because of your mother. It is because of her prayers, it is because of her discipline and dedication that you are being blessed with this chance. One of those days, uh, during one of the interviews that Bhagwan was giving for the dramas, there was the Vice Chancellor present in the room. We were a couple of students. And Swami, while talking about many things, Swami also spoke about the students who were seated in front of him. And Swami very casually mentioned, you know this boy, he has a younger brother. When he was small, he fell sick. He fell very badly sick. And his mother prayed very hard to me. And it is because of that prayer that I have saved that boy. He's my boy, Swami said. I was quite surprised because what, is, what Swami said was very true. And we never discussed on that. It was a true incident that when my younger brother was still a baby, he had an attack of what is called a woofing cough. It was in a very dangerous situation. But my mother had undertaken a fast at that time to Shirdi Baba. And many years later, almost 20 years later, Bhagavan was responding in a casual way that it is because of those prayers that Bhagavan responded by saving the baby's life. Once uh, when the family, our family was blessed with an interview, what I did was, since they were the five of us, Swami used to, those days, Swami used to sign uh, his pictures as blessings. So since, since they were five of us, I had carried five pictures of Bhagwan for his autograph. And once the interview was over and we were about to come out, I requested Bhagwan for his autograph. Bhagwan took the pen, but when he realized that there was more than one, he wanted to teach me a lesson on me being very greedy. Bhagwan said, it's a very important statement, he said, treat picture as God, not God as picture. So he said, treat picture as God, not God as picture. And Bhagwan did not sign those pictures, he just handed it over. I still remember that because that is the meaning that Bhagwan has mentioned in that particular sentence. Again, on one of those days when Bhagwan used to speak to the students after the evening interviews, Swami very often used to call foreigners for interviews. And one particular day, he pointed out to one particular foreigner devotee. And Swami said, you know, when he comes from his country, he gets down at Dharmavaram and from there he comes walking all the way to Prashant and Elam to have darshan. And Swami blessed that devotee and he sent him, sent him uh, away. But then Swami made one profound statement. Swami said, God doesn't want you to torture your bodies. What God wants is a change in your heart. Now, if you look at this sentence in the backdrop of so many rituals that happens in our country, where, you know, there's a lot of body piercing and all, all this is done to please God. So here is God himself saying that he's not moved by all this torturing of the body. What he gets moved by or what gets his attention is only a change in your heart. Days passed and there were many, there were many more interactions with Bhagwan, and I would like to narrate a couple of these uh, interactions as well. 
many a times when we see swami in the physical form we sometimes tend to forget who he is and sometimes swami himself decides to you know remove those clouds of uh, maya and show the real light that he is so let me narrate two instances where swami revealed his divinity swami was once talking to a group of students and swami mentioned that he had once met the saint of tiruvannamalai sri ramana maharshi swami was very young at that time and so they both had a long conversation and then sri ramana maharshi invited swami to have meals and as swami was having his meals maharshi was observing swami and once swami finished his meals there was still a little food left on his plate and maharshi asked swami swami are you filled is your stomach full and swami said yes and then suddenly what maharshi did was he took the remaining food from bhagwan's plate and he consumed it and bhagwan asked why did you do that and then ramana maharshi said swami until now i was only 90% enlightened today after having your prasadam i am 100% enlightenment now this is this is somebody is not an ordinary person he is considered a saint by many devotees and somebody like him talking about our bhagwan should give us an idea of who bhagwan really is on another one occasion swami again revealed uh, his real identity it is actually couple of uh, incidents which gives a complete picture the first happened uh, in the year 97 one evening bhagwan came very late for darshan now actually it would be wrong to say that bhagwan is early or bhagwan is late because whenever swami comes that is a correct time but when i say late compared to the usual time that bhagwan comes to mandir to give darshan he was late that particular day and as swami came to the second block which is right next to the samadhi swami looked at one of the teachers it was uh, our management teacher shri bhagya sir swami looked at him and said look at my eyes do you see anything different and you know the teachers were there students were all we were all looking at swami and we couldn't make out any difference so i said you know what happened i just finished my bath and i was drying my hair with a hair dryer and suddenly the power went off and i waited for a few seconds i was about to keep the hand dryer down when the power again came on and suddenly that blast of hot air it fell into my eye and swami said it has burnt my retina and swami at that moment he closed his eye and said i cannot see anything from this eye and we were all very shocked we didn't know how to react but swami just smiled and he walked away many months later swami during one of the interviews that he grants students who were taking part in the drama swami said as i said there are couple of things that provide a bigger picture swami said when he was a student they were once playing near a river bank so swami had also mentioned how those days uh, the poor children of the villages when they go to school they carry their lunch with them so swami used to carry uh, what is called sangati which mostly the farmers used to eat so swami used to prepare sangati and he used to round it into a ball and in the middle he used to keep chutney and what happens is after a few minutes maybe after half an hour this becomes hard so during lunch time what the students used to do they used to go to a river bank 
and they used to just dip this sangati in the water so that it it softens and swami said then they used to eat so on one such day after they had had their meals they were all playing uh, by the river bank and by chance a little bit of sand went into bhagwan's ear and what bhagwan did was he took a twig a small uh, branch of a tree and he started clearing the sand from his ears then one of the boys who was the brother of swami's classmate he wanted to create a little mischief so what he did was he came and he hit that stick that swami was using to clear his eye ears and immediately it started bleeding and all the boys were worried they all came running towards swami and swami took calm their fears he he kept his ear immersed under the water to stop the flow of blood and swami said from that day he could not hear from that ear later on when swami in his 30s 40s when he visited mumbai he was invited to the residence of a minister and after the meals were over swami used to take pan those days so swami was given pan a betel leaf and nut so unknown to anybody there was a small stone that was lying among the betel nuts so when swami started chewing that stone got stuck in between his teeth and it was very painful so the family who were, who were hosting him they were very upset so they said swami let's go to a doctor let's remove that stone and swami said no let it remain like that and then when swami narrated all these three incidents to us students swami said i can't see from one eye i can't hear from one ear and one tooth is broken i can't even chew with this side swami said long time back many centuries back even gautama buddha had this same characteristics he could not see from one eye he could not hear from one ear and he also had a broken tooth so this is again swami revealing his divinity when it comes to swami uh, many times when we pray to swami for something he may not immediately respond so we might think that swami is actually not responding to our prayers but in my experience when we desire something that is pure when we actually desire swami himself swami responds and if suppose you had asked for a simple thing swami gives it manifold so i would like to narrate a few instances where this uh, belief of mine is strengthened it was the year 1997 and before my parents formally came to bhagwan in 98 what my mother did was along with another mother of another student she came to parthi for just one day towards the end of 97 she came to see me she also came to have bhagwan's darshan that was the first time my mother was coming to prashant nilayam i had no desires in my heart at that moment but as the days neared and when my mother came to prashant nilayam that desire started growing my first desire was bhagwan please look at my mother and slowly the desire grew i said it it came to swami please speak to my mother and the desire kept on increasing in my heart so that particular evening it was the day when my mother was to go back to hyderabad from prashant nilayam bhagwan was standing outside talking to few of the students and i was fervently praying bhagwan today my mother is going back please talk to her please talk to her and swami though he was talking to some of the students he he looked at me and he said ayo papam which which means poor guy and he smiled swami did not call uh, my mother uh, the bhajans got over and i went back to the hostel 
I was sad that my mother was living and she was not blessed with a conversation with Bhagwan. But then I was surprised to know that when the the mother of the other student came, she said, "You know what happened in Cyclone Hall? Your mother fainted in Cyclone Hall." Now, what happened was my mother, being a diabetic, and since she had travelled only the previous day in bus, she she didn't have a proper sleep, and. right at the moment that bhagwan was standing outside talking to the students and when i was praying to bhagwan to please talk to my mother my mother was actually fainting there and she was helped out of the kulwant hall by some of the lady sevadals then i realized why bhagwan had not called her because she was not physically present in the hall now later on bhagwan did invite the family many times to the lotus feet of prashant nilayam and blessed it with many interactions so as i said you might have asked for a small small uh, interaction but bhagwan has given that response manifold times let me give another instance uh, this was in 1998 in kodakanal and it was the day of vishu Vishu is the New Year day for Malayalis, and the custom in a Malayali household on the day of Vishu is we prepare an an altar for that particular morning. So in the altar, along with the pictures of all the gods that we worship, we are also supposed to keep lots of fruits, vegetables, grain, pulses, money, jewelry. the belief is that on the day of vishu when you first have darshan of the altar with all this splendor the belief is that your whole year would be as plentiful or bountiful so that is the belief so here we were in kodakanal and there was another uh, classmate of mine who was also a malayali so we together along with two of swami's cooks who were also malayalis we got together we collected lots of vegetables and uh, fruits from the kitchen in kodakanal and we arranged an altar right outside swami's room so let me give you uh, a brief uh, of how the sai shruti residence of bhagwan is so on the first floor of sai shruti this is swami's residence Uh, right opposite Swami's room, there is another room for the students, but it's mostly filled with luggages, and the students sleep downstairs. So between these two rooms, there is a small sitting area. So every morning, when the students wake up, before Swami comes out, the students will sit just like we are sitting here. Students sit for Bhagwan to come out of his room, and we had arranged. this altar right next to a small sofa that swami used to sit on so swami every morning he used to come out from his room he used to sit on that sofa and he used to have a conversation with the students and that particular morning we had arranged this altar right next to swami's chair and there was one more custom as part of the new year uh, celebrations the idea is you keep some money in the altar and the elders in the family will give that money to the youngsters whatever it is 1 rupee 2 rupee how much ever it is and the youngsters are supposed to keep that money for one whole year with them because it is supposed to bring you good luck so we had to collect money so i went around asking all the students for all the coins that they have i collected all the 1 rupee 2 rupee coins and i kept it in the altar right next to bhagwan's chair and the next day the new year day bhagwan comes out swami sits on his chair swami talks to all the students he does everything but he does not look at the altar he is he is apparently ignoring it and finally when swami is about to get up from his sofa we requested swami Uh, please bless us some swami asked what is this 
So we said, Swami, this is the altar for the New Year celebrations. So Swami asked us to explain what it means. So we explained it to him. Then I handed over the bowl of coins to Bhagawan. And I requested Bhagawan to hand over one coin to each of the students. Swami said, wait, after breakfast, I'll give. Then we came down for breakfast and after the breakfast was over, in the ground floor when Bhagawan sits along with the students, Swami told the elders, Swami said, you know what these boys did? They had prepared this altar and they had uh, given these coins to, for me to give them. And Swami said, you expect me to give such small gifts? Swami said, no. And what he did was, to each of the students, Swami gave a 500 rupee note. Now, why I'm saying this is, you might have asked for a small thing, but when Bhagawan gives, it is manifold. Another beautiful instance that I would like to narrate, uh, this happened in Mudanahalli. We were a small group of students who were accompanying Bhagawan from Brindavan to Prashant Nilayam. And as it happens every year, the students and teachers of Mudanahalli, they request Swami to stop over at Mudanahalli for uh, lunch and bless them. That particular year, Swami agreed to stop over and the, the group, uh, we were a group of students and there were many elders of the organization along with Swami who were traveling along with him. So Swami took us around Mudanahalli. He showed us the Ganesh temple. He showed us the school and the, the, the cafeteria of the students. And finally, we came to the mandir where Swami would stay. Then the teachers took us to one hall where uh, there was a table set up for the students to have their meal. And Swami said, boys, sit down. And all the boys sat down, but there was one chair short and I was left standing. And when Swami saw that I was the only one standing, Swami appeared to be angry with me. Swami said, I told you to sit while you're still standing. So immediately one of the teachers said, uh, there is one more room, you come with me. And I was uh, taken to the other room. I, I felt a little sad because I had not made any mistake, but Swami apparently appeared to be angry with me. So when we went to the other hall, there was another table set up like this. And I, I was asked to sit down. So I was just waiting by the table and after a couple of seconds, Bhagawan and all the elders, they came to that particular room. And Swami told the elders to sit down. That is when I realized that only Swami and the elders would be sitting here. And I was the only student there. And so what I did was, I felt very embarrassed. So I went towards the end of the table and I sat there. And all the elders, they sat at this end of the table. And Swami asked for the food to be served and the elders started eating. Swami was just walking around the table for some time. And then what Swami did was, he came and sat at the chair right next to my chair. So just imagine, few minutes back, I was thinking that he was angry with me. But here, this is a blessing that I might never have imagined where I am sitting with my el elbow hardly three inches away from Bhagawan's elbow. This is a great blessing. There was one more instance where, uh, as I said, you may ask for something small, but Bhagawan wishes you with something much more manifold. This was during my uh, PhD days. So we used to spend our summers in Prashant and Nilayam, as was the rule. Even when Bhagawan was in Vrindavan, we used to be in Prashant Nilayam because all the research scholars have to be in Prashant Nilayam. And one day, Swami sent word for the research scholars to come to Vrindavan. So we all went and sadly, we didn't find any room. The Gokulam was filled. There's so many devotees in Whitefield who had come to have Bhagawan's darshan. So there were no rooms available. So whole morning we went around 
from one ex student to another ex student to find if there was a place to sleep and we didn't get any rooms so that afternoon after we finished our lunch we in fact slept on the terrace of some devotee's house under the hot sun right next to a water tank we spent that afternoon so in my heart i was feeling very bad because we resource scholars we are happily staying in in our own hostel in prashant nilayam but bhagwan had sent word that we should come to whitefield and here we are sleeping under an open sky under a very hot sun i was thinking why swami is putting us through all this trouble days passed but swami doesn't forget our thoughts believe it or not the very next summer swami had blessed this same group of research scholars to spend two months sleeping inside thrai believe it or not 68 days we got a chance to sleep inside thrai for one afternoon that we spent sleeping under the hot sun he blessed us with 68 nights of sleeping in thrai that is what swami is during so many interactions with swami as i said every interaction has a message hidden in it once there was a drama conducted in uh, the purnachandra auditorium this drama was enacted by the balvika students of hyderabad now this drama was about the mahabharata and there was this particular scene where uh, the uh, draupadi was being disrobed by the kauravas so this particular scene was happening and i was sitting among the students and watching the whole drama it was pretty far off the stage was far from where i was sitting and these are all young students who were enacting that drama so what i observed was this when draupadi was praying to lord krishna she was holding on to her garment and she kept on praying to lord krishna and at one point she just lets go of her garment and closes her eyes and completely prays to lord krishna and it is at that moment lord krishna responds so when this drama was enacted i could observe that particular scene next day during the morning darshan when bhagwan was passing by me swami asked did you see the drama last evening i said yes swami and swami referred to the same scene that i just mentioned swami said do you did you observe that as long as she was holding on to the garment god did not respond but the moment she let it go that is the moment of surrender and that is the moment when god responds very simple conversation but a great meaning in it so what happens when you surrender to bhagwan swami swami told this once suppose you have karma you have we all have many karmas that we are carrying over many births suppose you have 100 karmas and suppose you can you can consider each karma to be a 1 rupee coin suppose you are having 100 karmas so what happens is you are carrying 100 coins in your pocket now that is a very big burden because just imagine carrying 100 coins in your pocket what happens when you surrender to bhagwan when you surrender to god he reduces your burden how swami says you give me those coins i will give you a note so what god does is he takes those 100 coins and instead he gives you a 100 rupee note now please note the karma remains the same you had 100 karmas to start with you still have 100 karmas when you surrender but the burden of carrying that karma is reduced when you surrender to god there is another thing on surrender to god on belief in god that swami had mentioned i'll just give you an example this is what swami had mentioned swami said 
consider a, a spool of thread. So this is a spool of thread. And Swami said, each round, each round of thread is the good karma that you accrue in one single birth. So every birth gives you one round of good karma. But when you lose faith in God, when you start doubting God, what happens is, it's like dropping this pool of thread. When you drop a spool of thread, it removes many births of karmas. It is not just one or two that comes off, it's many births of karmas that you lose. So Bhagavan used to say, never lose faith in God. Always have same amount of devotion, always. I'm coming to the uh, end of the time provided. Let me just rush through some of the other experiences as a student. One important uh, facet of uh, living as a student in Swami's institutions is to take part in many cultural activities. I'm sure every student here has their own experience with Bhagwan on the cultural activities that they have taken part in. So I was also blessed to be part of many such dramas. And the main uh, cultural item uh, during the academic year in uh, Swami's institution is the convocation drama that takes place on 22nd November every year. And Swami, believe it or not, is the complete doer of the entire drama. I'll just give an example of what happens really. So one month or sometimes even two months before the convocation drama, Swami will start uh, casually one day in Mandir, he'll ask, so are we having drama this year? No, no drama. And that would suddenly spurt a lot of activity among the teachers and students. And after a couple of days, Swami will start calling in students and teachers. So what have you planned? And every day, Swami would uh, discuss, what is it that you are going to present to the devotees? What message are you going to convey? Which uh, epics are you going to relate to? If you, if, you, if you are aware, every convocation drama, we always have some inferences from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, and from the lives of many sages and saints. And Swami is involved in every step of, of the convocation drama. He would, he would be there when uh, the students are selected to play any particular character. What dialogues are written? What songs will be sung? Who is going to sing this song? Swami is involved in each and every step. And the best thing is, even though Swami is involved, when Swami comes for all the rehearsals, Swami is always living in the present. He never gives you an impression that, yeah, I know this, I know this is going to happen. No, Swami is always living in the present. Every time he watches a drama practice, he is always seeing it for the first time. And because of that, Swami always gives us more and more inputs on how to improve our performance. I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, incidents during this uh, entire uh, experience in all these convocation dramas. It was the year 1999 and this particular year we, we had a particular scene in the drama where we were picturizing a scene from the Mahabharata. And this story was told by Bhagwan himself during the interviews that he had given the students. Swami narrated this incident from the Mahabharata. He said, once when the Pandavas were in the forest, Lord Krishna came to visit them. And while leaving, Lord Krishna addressed Yudhishthira. Swami used to call Yudhishthira as Dharmaraja. Swami said, Lord Krishna, he, he pulled out a palm leaf 
and he inscribed on it a mantra and swami uh, lord krishna folded it and gave it to dharmaraja and said whenever you are facing a moment in your life where you do not have the answers to what's happening around you then you read this mantra and saying this lord krishna handed over the leaf and he went his way many days passed and in the mahabharata as you might be aware the pandavas was under constant pressure from the kauravas even though they were living in the forest they were still being tortured one way or the other and these brothers of yudhishthira they were asking him why should we suffer so much we have not done any harm to anybody so why should we suffer so much when all the four brothers were questioning dharmaraja he did not have the answers to any of this and at that moment he remembered this particular mantra that lord krishna had written and given it to him and he always used to carry it in a pocket on his dress and he takes that leaf and he reads it and the words written on it is this too shall pass this might seem to be a very simple and innocent message but if you look at the meaning behind it we need to tell ourselves it is not just the pandavas whenever we came we come to a circumstance where we are totally helpless we just have to remind ourselves that this too shall pass nothing is permanent no pain is permanent no pleasure is also permanent everything is trans uh, uh, moving nothing is permanent this is a beautiful message that bhagavan had conveyed through the students in that particular drama there was another beautiful uh, story that bhagavan had narrated and this is from the life of sri ramakrishna paramahamsa we this was not enacted as part of the drama but these are the stories that swami sometimes tells his students during those group interviews it so happened that uh, sri ramakrishna was fond of fish and every day he would send one disciple to go fetch fish from the market so when the student has to go to the market they have to cross a river they have to go to the other bank go to the market place and bring that fish so on one particular day sri paramahamsa calls a disciple named rakhal now in future rakhal goes on to become swami brahmananda he was a very soft child very sensitive to what others say so sri ramakrishna calls him and says rakhal you go to the market and bring this fish so rakhal gets onto the boat to go to the other side of the river there are some villagers sitting in the boat who do not believe in sri ramakrishna and some of them start making very negative comments about the master and rakhal being a very sensitive child he breaks down into tears he is unable to respond to them that afternoon when he comes back to the ashram sri ramakrishna asks him what happened why do you look so sad and the boy breaks down and says prabhu ji his disciples used to address him as prabhu ji again this is what swami had told us prabhu ji those villagers were making very negative remarks about you i could not help it i i burst into tears so sri ramakrishna got angry he said how is it that somebody speaks ill of your guru and you keep quiet you have your own experiences with your guru you have your own beliefs does not that belief help you in countering that argument you stand by your belief in guru and don't get moved by what others say next time if somebody says anything about your master stand up to your beliefs saying this sri ramakrishna blesses him and sends him away now all this is being observed by another disciple named narendra 
Who is Narendra? Narendra is nobody other than Swami Vivekananda himself. Now, Swami Vivekananda was a very aggressive person. So when he heard this advice from his guru, he decided, yes, if somebody says anything about my master, I will give it back. And a couple of days later, it was his turn to go get fish from the market. And as he sat in the boat going to the other side of the river, he impatiently waited for somebody to make a negative remark. He was, he was shocked to see that nobody is saying anything. So he picks up an argument and he gets into a fight and he pushes some of the villagers into the river. He then he goes to the market, he brings the fish and he comes to his master and very proudly he says, Prabhuji, this is what I did today. I pushed them into the river. And Sri Ramakrishna was very angry. He said, what is this? Is this what I teach you? Have I ever taught you, uh, taught you to adhere to violence? You must not respond like this. This is not how I have taught you to respond to negative remarks. And Narendra was very confused. He said, Prabhuji, the other day when Rakhal had the same experience, the instruction you gave him was different. But today, when I behaved in this manner, you are giving me a different instruction. Why is it so? And then Sri Ramakrishna responded saying, have you observed cycle tires? Sometimes some tires have very less air in them. So what does the mechanic do? He fills more air into that tire. Rakhal is one such example. He lacked confidence. It was my duty to give him that confidence. Now, there are also tires which has more than required air. What does the mechanic do? He removes some air from that tire. In your case, you are overconfident, Narendra. So what I did was remove that overconfidence. Now, the reason why uh, Swami to tells this experiences is that if you ask any student, whatever uh, had happened in the lives of Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples, every student of Bhagawan will feel the same thing. Even here, there was a guru and there were many student disciples and the mode of teaching was through conversation and through discourses. So any student of Bhagawan would very happily and easily relate to the experiences of Sri Ramakrishna and his disciples. Now I would like to uh, end this particular uh, discussion regarding convocation drama with a very funny experience. This is on the lighter side. This was in the year 1998. And in this particular drama, there was this scene of Sri Ramakrishna and Narendra. Narendra, as I said, is, is the boy who goes on to become Swami Vivekananda. And I had the great opportunity to play the role of Narendra Nath Datta. In that particular scene, there is this young boy who is visiting Sri Ramakrishna for the first time. In real life, if you read the life of Swami Vivekananda, as a youngster, he was troubled by lots of things. And he was in search of a master who had actually seen God. So in this particular scene, Narendra is coming to Sri Ramakrishna for the first time. And the first thing he asked the master is, have you seen God? And Ramakrishna Paramahamsa is the first person to say, yes, I have seen God. I have spoken to God. And that is the moment that changes the life of Narendra. And he goes on to become the celebrated saint that he became. So in this particular scene, Narendra comes to Sri Ramakrishna and after their conversations are over, Sri Ramakrishna asks Narendra to sing a song. If you actually read the uh, biography of Swami Vivekananda, this is an actual event that Narendra often used to sing 
songs, devotional songs in front of Sri Ramakrishna. So in this particular drama scene, here I was enacting the role of Narendra Nath Datta and I was to sing a song. Now this song was very popular those days, 1998. The, the title of this song was Chal Re Man and it was composed by Dr. Silesh Trivastava, one of his school teachers. And it was beautifully rendered by Brother Ravi Kumar, who I don't think needs an introduction to this audience. And on stage, it was me singing that song. And what happened was, uh, since Swami had already asked my parents to come to birthday celebrations that year, Swami had called us for an interview. And uh, before, before the convocation drama took place, Swami told my parents, see, he's going to sing a song on stage. See how beautifully he sings. And my parents actually believed that it was I who was singing. And that particular day, Convocation Drama, it went off great success, all owing to Swami's grace. And this song happened to be the highlight of that particular drama, Narendra singing this song to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. That evening, uh, when I went back to my parents' room, they hugged me and they were so happy. They said, we never knew you could sing so beautifully. And I did not say anything because I cannot speak the truth because Swami had mentioned something else. And again, when Swami called the family for an interview, Swami said, see how beautifully he sang this song. And I was like praying within myself, Swami, please don't put me into more trouble. Couple of months later, I happened to visit Hyderabad along with my brother. It was vacation time. And couple of neighbors came to see us. And during that brief uh, discussion, uh, one of the neighbors said, I, I heard that you sang a song on stage. Then my mother immediately said, why don't you sing that song for these neighbors? And I very silently prayed to Bhagwan to help me out of that situation. And then I said, Amma, that day when I sang the song, Swami was right in front of me. So that gave me the inspiration and devotion to sing like that. I cannot do it here. My mother fortunately did not press me further. She said, okay, okay, no problem. Couple of months later, it was again Guru Purnima and my parents were back in Prashantanilayam. Again, we were blessed with an interaction with Bhagwan. And during the course of that discussion, my mother raised this topic. Swami, when he had come to Hyderabad, I asked him to sing, but he said he will not sing without your presence. Swami said, is it so? I am here now, why don't you sing? And I am feeling so uh, troubled and agitated, I'm like, Swami, I'm just, I'm just continuing in with what you had started. Swami, please help me out. And then Swami, you know, whenever Swami smiles with you, there is a tinkle in his eyes, twinkle. Swami, it's, it's the feeling that says, I know, Ra, I know everything. You don't worry. I'll take care. And with a twinkle in his eyes, Swami said, Ayyo, what to do? There is no harmonium in the interview room. <laughs> He cannot sing without the harmonium. So, some another very beautiful incident that Bhagwan had blessed us with. Uh, I would like to uh, finish this uh, small talk with a, another beautiful experience. Uh, as I said, when you when your desire is Bhagwan Himself, Swami responds very beautifully. This uh, incident took place in the summer of 1998. This happens to be the last day. Uh, in Kodekanal and that particular morning we were starting back from Kodekanal back to Whitefield. As I said, uh, when Swami comes out of his room, there is a chair right outside his room and all the students would be seated. And opposite, there is another room where there is another chair. But Swami never sits in that chair. That particular morning, before Swami came out, all of us had packed our bags and we had already kept it in the truck to be taken to Whitefield. And every student was sad because 
that particular Kodai trip, which was a beautiful trip with lots of beautiful incidents, that was coming to an end. We were all sad. So when I kept my luggage and when I came upstairs, I realized that I was the last student. All the students were already seated and even Bhagwan was already outside. I, I was a few minutes late. So I sat towards the end. And as Swami knows what's happening, Swami knows why everyone is silent and sad. But Swami was trying to cheer everyone. And Swami was talking. And what happens is whenever Swami sits in a chair, all the students, they go close and they press Swami's feet doing Padaseva. And all the students had gone closer to Swami. And I was sitting in the end, I was feeling sad that this was the last day and Swami is sitting so far. I, I do not have the opportunity of touching His feet again. And the way Swami reacted is beautiful. After, after a couple of minutes of interaction with the students, Swami got up and what happens every day is Swami gets up and He goes downstairs. That day Swami said, come on boys, chalo, let's go. Swami gets up from his chair and all the boys, they make a path for him. And Swami again, as I said, when, when he does some mischief, he has a twinkle in his eye. Swami looks at me with a smile and he looks at the chair behind me. At that moment, it strikes me that I should move closer to this chair. What Bhagavan did was, he got up from that chair and instead of going down, he came straight and sat on this chair. I was sitting last when Swami was in sitting in that chair. But when Swami came here, I became the first student. And how beautifully Bhagwan responded, I only wanted to touch his feet. Swami kept both his feet on my lap. And we had another few minutes of beautiful interaction with Bhagwan. And I was, I was in tears because it was this simple prayer from my heart and Bhagawan had responded so beautifully. All my experiences, I can only tell you one thing and I've mentioned a couple of times. When your desire is Bhagawan himself, Swami's response is beautiful. You have to believe it. You have to experience it to believe it. Uh, this should... Uh, this brings my talk to an end. Uh, I thank you all for listening so patiently. I am one of many students who has had beautiful opportunities with Bhagwan. This experience was not about me, it was only about Bhagwan. If Bhagwan had showered so much love on just one student, just imagine how much of love he has, student, he has showered on all his students. And just imagine what is his capacity, what is the capacity of his love. I thank you all for being so patient and so, so immersed in Bhagwan's stories. I would like to thank the team of the Samarpan group who has taken so much trouble to arrange for this particular meeting month after month. And I would like to thank Swami on behalf of my whole family for having brought all of us to his lotus feet. Somebody once asked Swami, Bhagwan, you have given so much love to your students. How will they ever repay you? And Swami gave a beautiful answer. Swami said, if they think of me, that is enough. Couple of weeks back when one of the brothers called me and asked me whether I would be willing to come here and talk about my experiences with Bhagwan. I agreed immediately because it was an opportunity for me to relive those moments again with Bhagwan. These are things that has happened almost 20 years back. And for me to relive those experiences is very good for me. And in a way, I am repaying a tiny bit of what Bhagwan had blessed me with. When you associate yourself with Swami, you become something. On a normal day, I'm, I'm nobody, I'm a lay person. But today, when I stand in front of you, it is only because of my association with Bhagwan. 
I remember during 1998 when we were traveling by bus along with Swami to Kodaikanal. We students used to be in a bus right behind Swami's car, and all the way from Bangalore we used to drive to Kodaikanal. It was a many hours journey, and couple of times during that journey, Swami would stop his car, get down from his car, and get into our bus. So just imagine bus with. 20 30 students and only swami and swami also used to be like a child and the convoy would keep on moving and there would be devotees gathered on both sides of the road and they will be praying namaskars to swami's car when swami is in the bus the swami used to smile and say see they are saying namaskar to the car where i am sitting inside the reason why i am saying is the car is associated with swami and that is why that is getting the obeisances from the devotees there might be lots of slippers lying outside the mandir but if somebody says this slipper was worn by bhagwan everyone will touch it to their eyes why because it is associated with bhagwan i thank you all once again i thanks the samarpan team and i proficiently thank bhagwan for giving me this opportunity to come here and speak to all of you i would once again like to convey you the best greetings on the occasion of sri ram navmi jai sara thank you <laughs>